So it's like growing up that way where you're just being criticized and belittled and made fun and like we call it bullying now, but it made me the man I am today. You Are know? you worried about the softness of our the next 100%. generation? This next generation is that is so soft. It's 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 like and that's why there's certain things I keep away from my kids. There's yeah. so many things my kids can't even watch on TV because I don't I don't want them to be unconsciously programmed to to not be able to take criticism. I don't want them to be programmed to 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 be weak and to not understand the importance of hard work and th to believe that you're just going to be handed everything because you know, you're not going to be handed everything. Mm. And so 100 percent like. The, these next generation, I, I'm, I'm just, it's, it makes me nervous. Yeah. I'd like to thank another sponsor of the podcast, and that's Element, pronounced Element, but actually spelled L M N T. Phenomenal, phenomenal product. They come in single serving packets, it is an electrolyte solution. It contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio, and that's 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium. If you are training hard, or let's say you're inspired by Remy's story, because Remy, let me tell you, he gets after it every morning. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs and is perfectly suited for folks on any kind of diet, whether you're low carb, paleo, standard American, keto, you name it. Electrolytes help with cramping, they help with fatigue, they help with recovery because you do need to maintain a good hydration. You can find Element at Drink Element, that's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash Dr. Lion. This deal is only available through my link. You will get a discount. Again, go to Drink L-M-N-T dot com slash dr lion totally can try it risk-free and if you don't like it they'll give you your money back i think that you guys will really enjoy this formula we do too it's been a crazy journey so it's always a blessing to be able to share yeah know, especially the updates as it relates to the story I haven't not done a podcast yeah <laughs> Remy, you have not i i know because i was yeah. i was looking you haven't done a, a podcast in a hot minute yeah yeah i think it's been about a year maybe a year and a half just because i've just been non-stop on different film and tv projects and writing and different things so. which is really interesting it's a, yeah. a a second career for you it is it is and it's my passion it's become you know I, I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else other than storytelling you know it's something that probably has been within me ever since i was a little kid loved mm. films tv show my mom she would expose my brother and i to the arts whether plays or films and different things and so i, I didn't unconsciously i think it just became a part of my nature mm. and then fast forward to you know now it's like it's what wakes me up every morning well, wakes me up earlier all you know, right you know, like, Wait, how early are we talking well at my four kids and, yeah. you know your wife is a doctor so i know she's getting up early what? yeah the alarm clock you know my alarm clock is often set for seven but i often beat it up beat it around i wake up about 5 50 sometimes just because i'm just I'm just ready to get after it. I'm ready to start the day. Like my yeah. like my my least favorite day of the week is uh, is Friday. Really? It, because I know that you know I'm not going to be able to. You know, like, granted, my family time is important. And I don't forsake that in any yeah. way. But I just know I'm not going to. I'm, I'm I'm gonna lose that momentum. I'm not going to be able to keep the grind going as much as I do. My favorite day of the week is Monday. I love Mondays. I love Mondays because it's like a, it's an opportunity to do the work that's going to help bring my dreams into fruition. Mm. You know, what so, are your dreams now? You know, my overall goal, you know, over the last few years has been to direct my first feature film. Like everything that I've done in the film and TV industry from, you know, 2016 Transformers to now consulting, acting, writing, like has all pointed and led to this moment to direct a feature film and to start my career as a director. Um, and that's really unusual. I was, yeah. I was, I actually did a, looked at some statistics, by yeah, the way. Are you yeah. ready for this? Yeah, yeah. Um, I am going to mention you're a Navy SEAL, but we're, yeah. we're, at, we're actually not going to talk about your military career, yeah. which well, is, yeah. is going to be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there are 3,000 active duty Navy SEALs yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. at any one given point. Yeah. 1.3% of them are African American. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which means, yeah. which I calculated this, uh, 39. 
Yeah, 30. 39, or yeah. is it maybe 30, 39 at any given time or yeah. during this. Um, and so first of all, that yeah. is a very small number. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. screenwriters, yeah, yeah, yeah. there is, do you know the statistic? No, I, I, I know the last, I'm sorry, favorite. I want you to say, <laughs> the last statistic I heard was it is, uh, it's way easier to get drafted and this is what my WGA meant when I got into the WGA, which is the Writers Guild okay. of America, for my for a, a screenplay I got commissioned to write. She said that it's um, the statistical is it's easier to get. Well, it's not necessarily statistics, more of a statement, but it's easier to get into the MLB, drafted into the major in, into Major League Baseball, than it is to to get accepted into the Writers Guild of America. One percent. Yeah. One yeah. percent of screenwriters make it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. How does it feel to be such an underachiever? <laughs> you know, it's just more, I've just always liked to do the hard thing. You know, um, even when I was a little kid, I've always sought after the hard path. And I think, you know, being a seal, you know, a lot of seals get out, and it's like, you know, they go into, you know, maybe business consulting, they go into tactical consulting, they go yeah. into private contracting, and and or you know, just you know, jobs that rely on having been a seal. And I. Physical, think, physical, physical, but it's so interesting. Yeah. Your job yeah, yeah. relies on your mental. cognition exactly. and your storytelling ability. Exactly, exactly. Did you ever think that you were going to, I mean, you really you did have a, a bit of a rough time growing up, which yeah, people yeah. can read about in your book. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. I read your book, Transformed in Three Days. Oh, thank, thank you so you. much. I'm glad yeah, you I got enjoyed a, it. a signed copy. Yeah. But um, did you, when you know you were getting out of the Navy and you were a, a SEAL for eight, Eight years. eight years, yeah, yeah. Third, I was in the Navy for a total of thirteen, and then eight of those thirteen were in the teams. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you were a, a corpsman before, a corpsman in the teams. I was a corpsman uh, at First Marine Division before I went to um, before I went to Buds, and then being a corpsman, it was just yeah. natural. My platoon was like, all right, my chief was like, <laughs> you know, you're going to be a, a platoon corpsman. So I was a platoon corpsman, and I was a human guy in the teams. Yeah. Which is also very cerebral. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. You know, being you know human. I mean, being a medic, yeah, that revolves a lot of neck up uh, um, um, abilities, and but also and, and being able to think on your feet and okay. remember procedures as it relates to keeping somebody alive. But also the human side of things that are you know it's it's about how do you communicate to a person who you never met and how do you pull information out of that person that's necessary for yeah. an operation. And then after you've gathered all of that information, how do you write it? Because it revolves around a lot of writing. How do you write it in a way where somebody can pick up that report five, six, seven, eight, ten years from now you know and exactly. revisit all those events happen that day. You know exactly. He's a doctor right now all the time, so you know. <laughs> and your wife is a doctor, yeah, so I'm sure you guys have the, yeah. these kind of conversations. Yeah. When you were transitioning out, did you know what you were going to do? I, I had an idea, so when I got out, like, I, I I, I, I thought I was going to kind of go into business consulting. You know, I, I was uh, in grad school at the time. What were you studying um, in grad school? Uh, or, uh, my master's in or organizational strategy, essentially. I got it from the, mm. the, the teams had a partnership with uh, University of Charleston, West Virginia. <laughs> and uh, right. my degree's up there. And, uh, um, and so I did my bachelor's there and then went on to my master's and, and my bachelor's in organizational leadership. Mm -hmm. my, my, my bachelor's and then my master's was in uh, organizational strategy, focus on organizational strategy. And it was a somewhat of a business degree. So I figured, you know, I kind of like what other team guys have done, utilizing my experience in special operation, those principles such as communication, leadership, teamwork, um, critical thinking, and then merging those principles with my academics and then kind of taking that to the corporate world, hmm. but then also working with athletes as well to help pass on those principles to them. And so, you know, that's kind of where I figured I would go. I, I started doing public speaking as Did well. Did you like that? Because I'm sure, you know, at least from what I see, right, um, the public sector, yeah, 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 the civilian yeah. sector is yeah. so much different yeah, than the military in terms of their feelings, yeah. in terms of the way in which they communicate, in yeah. terms of their dependability. And somewhere, though, yeah. it, it, you pivoted to yeah. screenwriting. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, how did that even happen? Yeah, so, you know, I got out in May of, I got out in January 2016. And you were a, a, you were a West 
East Coast team. Yep, East okay. Coast. Sorry, sorry, sorry. West, West Coast. Coast team. Um, uh, E6 is what I was getting at. Okay, E6. Uh, I was an E6 West Coast team and um, uh, got out in January. I was still in, I was in grad school at the time, you know, kind of just pretty much jump, you know, as I was getting ready to get right. out, I already started the grad school program. And uh, so it made um, the transition a bit easier because you had something yeah, to yeah. focus on. And, you know, another thing I wanted to do, I tell veterans this all the time, like when you know you're going to get out, it's good to have a plan, just like in the teams oh, where, you, sure. know, you, you know, you, you can't go on an op without a plan. And so, like, I plan ahead, you know, I saved a, a chunk of money mm. so that that way I wasn't have to, having to take a job just to survive. I could really take the time to kind of build my businesses and focus on what I wanted to fo focus on. And so I'd save money, you know, had the school as part of the plan, and then got out January 9th of 2016. Um, and I, I started, you know, having meetings and trying to, you know. But you weren't sure work. exactly what you were going to be doing. I knew, I knew what I wanted to do. I just didn't. I was just trying to book the work. Okay. You know, it's just, you know, it, it was just like, it, it's, it's, it's. A, because I didn't have a lot of time to really build the brand. You know, I had time to build the concept, but now, it's, now after you've built the concept and you have the curriculum, you still mm. have, you have to, how do you market that? Right. You have to market that in order to, 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 to get clients. And so I didn't have a huge client base. Mm. And and so, you know, I was, you know, making phone calls and reaching out to my brother-in-law and just doing all these things. And, you know, it wasn't quite working out as I expected. And uh, March came around, beginning of March came around, and I'm, I'm, I'm close to the Gifford family, Kathy Lee Gifford and her son Cody were really good friends. Uh, as a matter of fact, he's a writing partner on a project that I wrote, and um, they invited me to Israel. So I went to Israel with them, and you know, it was so cool because I got to walk the Holy Land and kind of see all these sites. But the great thing about that trip was I really got a chance to kind of reflect mm. And, and, you know, just be away from technology. Which and, is really you know, important. We're very you, distracted. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And just, just be in nature. And, you know, that really expanded my mind and, and kind of gave me a peace. And, 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 and the message that I got out of that trip was everything that you need is already within you. Like mm. everything that you need to succeed, to build your businesses, do whatever it is that you're going to do, it's already within you. Um, so have confidence in that. So that almost sounds as if it was a message. It was. It absolutely was. It was. It was a message, but it was also a healing process in there as well. And it was healing as, as it relates to because you know being in the military and then going into the teams, the life is very abrasive. You know what I mean? You think? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know the deal. You're married oh, yeah. to a seal, so you know the deal. Yeah. It's a very abrasive life, and so it's also culturally uh, abrasive in the way that it's not about weakness. It's yeah. not about not you know, expressing your feelings, yeah, it's, yeah. it's none of that. It's about getting the job done, yeah. you know, going through workups, going to deployment, like also focus Also being on, disconnected in some yeah, way, right? 100%. To get, to get the job done. 100%, it, because you can't have distractions, right. you know, when you're downrange, you know? And so it was just, I, I needed some type of healing, and, I don't, and this might come off weird, I don't mean it in the sense of like, you know, like abuse, or like I was abused or anything like that I needed, but it was just like some type of transitional healing of that could kind of help me come back to civilian life, yeah. you know, and that trip did that for me. So along with me receiving that message, mm -hmm. I also received like a, a transitional healing, if That's that makes incredible. sense. It does. And, um, and so I got back the end of March, April, you know, I just was like, I'm going to focus on school, focus on school. Um, and then um, May, uh, uh, first week of May, a good buddy of mine who I went through buds with and who I, you know, who I served with at, at, at Team 3, he was he was killed on a hop, mm -hmm. uh, Charlie Keating. And uh, and that that really, really crushed me. And uh, and fast forward. I was at his memorial service uh, and a guy came up to me who was in the teams and he was just like, you know, you know obviously sorry for your loss. And then he was just like, hey, some money in Hollywood was trying to trying to be trying to get in contact with you. And I was just like, Hollywood, like, why would some money in Hollywood be trying to get in contact with me? And he's like, hey, can I grab your number? 
So I said, sure. So I gave him my number, and then he passed my number to a, uh, a woman who worked, worked in the business, and, and, and she reached out to me, I want to say two weeks later, so this is now mid-May, and then she was just like, hey, Michael Bay's working on a new film called Transformers, and, you know, I um, want to know, he's, he's looking for somebody with your background to, to work on a project, and I was just interested to see if you would be available. What did they want you to do? So it was like be on camera, but also part of being on camera was also like being able to consult. Okay. So being able to, to not just be on, stuff yeah, not yeah, the gun the authenticity with the moving with a weapon and certain terminology and all those things, you know, like they had like a lead consultant on the project, but it was just one of those things where it's just like, okay, like we just don't want an actor. We want somebody right. who can, 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 you know, shoot, move and communicate mm -hmm. and make it look authentic, but also, you know, be able to self consult or if they see something that's off, be able to call it out so that that way the director and the other people People can recognize that and can deal with it right away. And so that was it. It was just supposed to be one day. And then fast forward to the teams, you know, being a humid guy and, and you know, having to, I had to write, you know, after I had meetings and didn't, you know, with sources and I had to write these long detailed reports. Mm -hmm. And as I said, mentioned earlier, they had to be, they had to be visual. I had to write in a way that was visual. I don't mean I had to draw like, right, you know, right. pictures, but they had to write visually. And, uh, and, and so that gave, that kind of gave me some, that gave me more experience as a writer, but that also increased my hunger as a writer. So fast forward to when it came time to write my book, you know. How did you decide to write your book? Or were you yeah. like, I'm really gonna trial yeah. my chops at storytelling? Yeah, well. Because you hadn't done storytelling, even yeah. if you're, meeting mm -hmm. with the CEOs or these business people. Yeah. It's not storytelling yeah. per se in the way that you're doing it now. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a completely different realm. Um, I, yeah, I signed a book deal and initially when I signed a book deal, because my mom was a creative writer. And so initially I signed the book deal with the idea that my mom would write the book. And so, oh my mom, God. Yeah. And did they say that they were like, sure? Okay. And they were like, yeah, they were like, because okay. they looked at my mom's writing and stuff like that. And, you know, my mom wrote, uh, I want to say she wrote two chapters and I read them and I was just like, this is not my story. It's not your voice. This is her. Not, and it wasn't necessarily my voice. It wasn't my story. Mm. It was more her story. And it was more my story from her perspective. Mm. And, you know, like everything, we all have different perspectives and we all see things completely different, even, you know, especially a parent and a child. And, you know, I had different experiences growing up in the Bronx because I was in the streets than my mom did because my mom was a mom. And, right. you know, she was in the house for the most part. And, and so. And she had no idea all the trouble you were getting. Exactly, exactly. And so I just, I just did a pay, I just started all over. I said, mom, you know, I love you, um, no offense. I need to write this, I need to tell this story. And so, you know, I picked up the, my, I mean, that's the computer I wrote my book on. I sat at that desk and I just started, I just started getting it out of my head onto mm. the page. Was it difficult? Know. No, it wasn't because I, for a few reasons, one, um, I told my story, I've told my story so many times already. You know, I've had so many people, mm. who had, had, even when I was in Buds, you know, prior like Charlie Keenan. Yeah, so you yeah. told your story prior to writing it. Yeah, I told my story countless times, you know, because uh, people, even when I was in Buds, Charlie Keating, for example, be like, dude, just crazy. Like, you came from Africa and then, like, you went to the Bronx and then, like, you're a SEAL, like, you're, you're a Buds and trying to be a SEAL. Right. Like, how does that work? Tell that story. So I would, I told the story like a million times. And so, and I knew that um, from storytelling, I knew that you have to hook the reader, you know, with your with your first chapter. You have to give your reader something which makes them say, I want to find out how this person got from point A to point B and I want to turn to the next page. And so, you know, it was a combination of having told my story a million times. The second thing that helped me was, um, you know, along with the well, second thing was obviously having the experience with my mom and then also having the experience in the teens. But the third and the third thing that helped me exponentially was I was actually at the Lee Strasberg Theater Film Institute at the time. Just I was there. I was I went there. You know, I had some 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 money left on my post 11 GI Bill and they were accepting it. And I was already I had this is after Transformers had come out. OK, and, so you knew. So you went and you worked on Transformers and you loved it. And, and, well, not necessarily love the, the acting experience. I just I enjoyed the sto storytelling. Interesting. Like at the end of the day, it always came back to storytelling. I love the ability to be able to tell story 
um, through acting, through writing, uh, through through consulting, mm. like through consulting, like helping shape a story through consulting to make it more authentic. And so it wasn't necessarily I was infatuated with acting, it was just more of like, I love the idea of storytelling. Okay. Um, and so, uh, I, I was, so when I finished Transformer, I was just like, you know, I need to get some actual training. I need to get some experience here so that I know exactly what I'm. What makes a good storyteller. Yeah, what makes a good storyteller. And, and you know, if I'm gonna act like, you know, do it properly, right? Because <laughs> yeah. it's the one thing, you know, in the teams, you gotta train to be able to work, you know, and the same thing. And so um, I went to the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute and it was a phenomenal experience uh, because they teach method acting. So, I mean, Al Pacino was trained under Lee Strasberg. I mean, you name it for a person with Ange Angelina Jolie, uh, Marilyn Monroe, if my memory serves me right, so many great actors mm -hmm. train under Lee Strasberg and his method, which is a specific type of method acting. And so I went there and I learned method acting. I learned I learned um, uh, improv, improv, I learned um, scene study, all of these things, and they all translated to telling a story. And so it, it didn't feel weird to you. I'm sure the listener is thinking, mm. wait, so this guy went from yeah. being <laughs> yeah. in Africa to yeah. the Bronx yeah. to getting in trouble, yeah. which they can read about, to yeah. becoming a SEAL, and yeah. then all of a sudden, 180, but not yeah. necessarily yeah. a 180. Yeah. You know, were they like, how is this guy yeah. acting? And yeah. did you feel weird about it at all, or were you just completely zoned in? And now, you know, it's, I, it, I was zoned in because, again, you know, I'm a very, I like to take the hard path, but I also like to take in my mindset the logically hard path. Hmm. So it's like for me, it's like one plus one equals two. So if I want to progress in my career, then this needs to be done. Like whether it may seem weird to act in a certain way or to do certain scenes or to do some things out of the norm, I know that that's the path to get to where I want to be. Sounds like you didn't overthink it. No, not at all. It not sounds all. like you just executed that mm -hmm. this was the next logical step. Exactly. Did you feel that destiny played a role in any of that? Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. You know, I'm a person of faith, and so I, I believe that like everything that's happened to me, every door that's closed, every door that's open, you know, God's been there. You know, like I'm not the type of person that's like God does everything for you at all, but I am of the belief that you know, you know, it, it, we live in a physical world, and so there's a part that we have to do and I believe that God opens the door in it but we have to physically walk through the door. God will give me the tools but I have to physically lift the tools and wield, wield those tools mm -hmm. and so I totally believe you know and the, that you know everything that's happened to me is I couldn't have I couldn't have made it all happen like on my own. <laughs> no you know? way. Yeah, it's, just, it's just too crazy and that when I think of the odds and the way things have transpired in my life and even like being led to the Strasbourg Lee. That's what Institute. I was curious about is mm -hmm. it seems as if in life there yeah. is, whether it's a voice or yeah. a knowing or just some weird yeah. chain of events yeah, that yeah, happen yeah. Yeah. that put someone in a position where yeah. you just know that that's the right. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever get stuck when you're writing? I, I don't, you know, it's so crazy because I got this question um, uh, last weekend from a writer. She just, um, she went to uh, college in LA to study screenwriting mm -hmm. and um, and she just graduated a year ago and she, was just, she asked me that question, do you get writer's block? And I said, no, I don't. Like, I literally do not, it's the craziest thing. I How don't get writer's possible? block. I think it's because um, a few things. I think one is like, I, I have all of these tools did that mm. I've learned over the years. Like what? I'm like, just like, selfishly for, curious because for, I'm writing my first book. Okay, so for example, you know, the idea to interview your characters. Mm. Like you can, like, and and, and I, what I did was, just to speak to that, to close that loop, I interview people who I, who are in the book. Mm. Just so I could also get, uh, Let's get my story from their perspective. For example, I interviewed my ex that's in the book. I interviewed the guys I grew up with, Ricardo, all those people. Like I interviewed them so that that way I could understand a character a little bit more, be refreshed mm. on the character as I'm writing. So that helped me because when I, if, and if I was to get stuck, like, man, what did Ricardo say? What did this person say? I had that tool. Oh, you know, Ricardo in this interview that I just did, you know, two days ago, he said this, 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 not or he said it in a certain way. So now that now I'm refreshed as to how he would react, how he reacted 20 years ago. And so being able to interview your characters, like having that is a tool. Mm -hmm. Another tool is, is um, I believe in organic writing. 
I believe that once you have your character locked down uh, to a T and you know everything about that character, like for me, character drives story. I don't care if it's a nonfiction, fiction, whatever it is, character always drives story. You know, so often, you know, plot, a lot of people have plot drive the story, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, every single person who watches a movie or TV show, in my opinion, what do they remember? They remember the characters most times. They will remember the character more so than remembering the plot. Mm -hmm. Like, they'll remember Indiana Jones. They'll remember the Terminator. They'll remember, you know, Neo from The Matrix. They'll remember the character. They'll be like, ah, I can't remember what that movie, but I love that character, right? And so for me, it's all about like, like when I know the character, and I know this might sound weird because I'm assuming you're writing a nonfiction book. Yeah, right. there are no characters yeah. in my book. I mean, but yeah. actually, I suppose there are. It's the reader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, the reader. It, it's a, and it's knowing that reader. That reader, if the reader is the reader, then it's knowing that yeah. character, right? So that's one way. Another way is is um, another tool that I learned was uh, the importance of kind of like like what you know I mentioned earlier when to enter and exit the scene, um, but also like this idea of of writing organically, trusting your knowledge, hmm. trusting you know, tr yourself, trusting, trusting yourself, your and trusting yeah. your knowledge, trusting that you know how to tell the story, you know how to write this book more so than anybody. I think a lot of writers get writer's block because they doubt themselves. That's really powerful. I think that a lot of it is like, they doubt, should I be doing this? Like, this, this sounds, a lot of negative self-talk, this sounds stupid. This do is, you ever get that anymore? I, if I do, you know, I did a whole talk on this a couple of weeks ago, but if I do, I've learned to attack the seed. Hmm. So How do yeah. you identify the seed? If it's negative. So essentially, like, you know, if the seed is, if the seed is as simple as, um, you're not gonna be able to finish this. Or if the seed is as simple as, this, is a pain. this sounds stupid, mm. or this is not gonna work. I attack it, I say, no, it's not, sound, it doesn't sound stupid. Here's why, and, and not just saying, not, not just attacking it with like a simple, superficial, it doesn't sound, here's why it doesn't sound stupid. Here's why I'm gonna make my timeline. You know, so that's what I mean by attack. When those negative thoughts come in as and a writer, it shuts writing, them up really quickly. It shuts them up, and sometimes you have to be more real. You have to be real with us because we, as human beings, we do negative self-talk to ourselves all the day, all the time, right? All day we're talking about, I'm not going to make it on time. I don't like the way this looks. This yeah. and that. Like we're always saying these negatives. Such oh, ingrained, cookies, terrible. Exactly, yeah. it's such ingrained yeah. in our nature that you know, in order to combat it, we kind of have to be relentless. Yeah, we have to be relentless, and so I will be relentless on that. See that negative thought over until it's been completely dispelled. Mm. And so I think, you know, as a writer, that's that's another tool that I've learned is the importance of of of, of trusting that I know what I'm talking about. And a lot of that comes from, which is another thing I learned in the Lee Strasberg Institute, was doing your research. Mm. You know, doing your research on a character, doing your research on the topic. So it's essentially right? showing up prepared when you're sitting down to exactly. write. Exactly. Or do, do the anything. Work. Exactly, exactly. Do the work because when you, do, when you have that, when you utilize that tool, it's going to be hard to get stuck. Mm. It's going to be hard to get stuck. Another thing that, another tool that I learned in Strasbourg was the, the points of, you know, when you get an idea for a character, you get an idea for how to do something, right, just even if you just do a quick note, mm -hmm. do a quick note so that you have that so that you can refer to it. And, you know, on every friend, on every screenplay I write, Every book I just signed, I just signed a book deal last year. Congratulations! For, thank you, thank you. I mean, late congratulations. No, thank you. That's no, exciting. It's for, it's for a fiction thriller series, and um, uh, I I can't tell you how I had, like the, the you, if you open up one of the notepads, you would just see all of these all of this information on the book. Same thing with the screenplays. Mm -hmm. I just finished the screenplay for a follow up to. Uh, a short film that I wrote and directed. And when I was writing the screenplay, it was just all of these notes, because as soon as an idea came about a character or something, I just, no matter how stupid, mm. how small it might be, it could have just been one word. I wrote it down immediately. If I was on a treadmill, I wrote it down immediately. And, and you know, it, it was a fulfilling thing as I was writing to be able to like, Scratch it off, yeah. but check it off. Yeah, I handle that. That thought mm -hmm. that came to me on this date, I took care of it. That's in the screenplay. That's in, the, and I can remember 
I can remember where I was when I got some of the ideas. Yeah, you know, some that's of the, for, interesting. For, for, for the screenplay, you know, for screenplays or projects, which another tool, and this is not necessarily a tool that I learned in, in this Lee Strasberg Institute. I think this is just a tool that I learned in general is the importance of fitness. You know, like when it comes to like when I'm, I get so many ideas when, you know, for books and, and, and screenplays and just business on when I'm active. Yeah. Like when I'm on the treadmill and the blood is flowing and like I'm active, it's the craziest yeah. thing. Like I get all of these I ideas. Do too. So you know the I deal. Do too. And yeah. I think it's something. I don't know. I mean, you're, it shuts your mind off. It you, shuts your mind off, and you're mm -hmm. executing on the like the movement. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know if it's also something where it's like some more blood flow to the brain. Definitely. So your brain well. is like getting, you know, just, I, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, you're a doctor, so you can probably speak to, a, you can speak to a way more than I can. Uh, so, but it's every time I work out, especially when it's the harder to work out, yes. the more things that come to my brain. And like, even like- I think it puts you in the flow state. Yeah. I, I, and also yeah. I think that you're designed for hard physical work. Listen. We can't all be a Navy SEAL or, like Remy, play one on TV. However, we can all optimize our individual body. The way that we can do this is through one of the sponsors of the podcast, and that's InsideTracker.com backslash Dr. Lion. Definitely want to check them out. Also, again, you have to know what you're working with, baseline blood work, for performance is essential. Inside Tracker really allows for personal empowerment. You can go to insighttracker.com slash Dr. Lion to get 20% off. And that's for their entire store. So if you want to really see what you're made of, go check them out. Insidetracker.com. And that sounds like yeah. you have really specific habits. 100%. Everybody, uh, I would say mm -hmm. people that are very capable yeah. have very unique, fine-tuned habits. Yeah. I'm curious as to what your habits are. I know this is an incredibly broad question, but mm -hmm. I'm sure that you've thought <laughs> about yeah. your habits. No, I ha yeah, I have, I have. My wife is... is She's always, she, she always gets on me. She's like, you are exactly, you do this, this, this. We, there's no room for it. We have arguments about it sometimes. But yeah, I mean, as far as my daily routine, you know, um, I, I get up early and a lot of, like I said, a lot of time, most of the time my alarm clock doesn't wake me up. And I can go to bed late, and but my alarm clock will not wake me up. Well, my alarm clock will not need to wake me up because I get up before it. And, you know, I do my devotional in the morning. Uh, to kind of clear my day and center myself. And then I, I come downstairs and I have a specific breakfast. There's two breakfasts I have. One is I juice um, broccoli, carrots, kale, um, ginger, turmeric, strawberries, celery, and a green apple. Uh, I'll juice that in the morning and I'll take the pulp uh, out and I'll take the broccoli and they say, I know this to a T. I'll take the broccoli and the carrot pulp out and I'll put it into the mix. It's the most disgusting drink. But Sounds rough. It's horrible. It's horrible, especially <laughs> with the ginger. with the nose, yeah, nose plugged, with, yeah. yeah. with the ginger and the turmeric, does it make it better either? <laughs> and I do that, you know, uh, typically on Monday and Tuesdays. You know, Monday's to start, you know, my work week. Just, it just helps me and cleanses me out. And then, um, and then Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I do my uh, bowl with, you know, antioxidants, blueberry, uh, strawberry, uh, and Saturday, blueberry, strawberry, uh, uh, blackberry, uh, uh, pomegranate seeds, coconut shreds, nuts, just to kind of, you know, start my morning fresh. Um, uh, after, I, after I have that, my kids are usually down by that time, make them breakfast, get their day started. And this is when I'm home because I do travel a lot. And then um, as, as soon as 8.30 hits, my nanny starts at 8.30 and I go straight into, straight to the gym. Okay. Like that's where I start my day. Like, uh, you know, Brad works with me and, and you know, his whole, all the emails and text messages and stuff that comes in for work, like he'll handle. Uh, so that that way I can just go to the gym and I need to do, I need to start my day. You have to train. My work day with training. So 8.30 till about, you know, uh, 10.30 I train. Um, How long have you been doing that? I mean, I want to say since I got out. 
since I since I got out. And you don't miss it things. unless you fall down. <laughs> yeah, unless I fall. Well, even when I fall, I fall down. I fall down. I still, I'll do. I still do something. <laughs> there you goes Rami. Yeah, He's yeah. I'll still do. The, I'll, yeah. I'll do the. I'll do. I have a row machine and concept two rows. So I'll do the row. I'll do. I'll always You'll do, do something, something no matter what. I'll do something no matter what, even if it's as simple as you know. Like if I had like sometimes I'll get those anomaly days where like I have like an important me because I have projects that I do outside the U.S. And so because of the time zone difference, I'll have to have a meeting, you know, super early in the mm -hmm. morning or maybe at 830. And so like if, if that screws up my time and I got to get back into my office at like 11 o'clock, then I'll still do like some sit ups and jumping jacks mm. like I'll, to get my You'll heart rate. You'll still do it no matter what. I, no matter what. No ifs, ands, or buts. No matter. I have to be dead or sick or something. And it's not because you're not telling yourself you have to do it. It's you love it and yeah. you for yourself. It's a part of who I am. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just like it's like eating breakfast. It's like drinking water. It's not even it's, it's not even a thought. I can't imagine not being active right. for an hour and a half to two hours, Monday through Friday. And you I don't even have to integrate it. It's already there. It's already there. I think that's why people yeah. don't maintain their fitness because they're yep. still divided. Yeah. And there's no division. This yep. is, you are a physical being. 100%. You have to execute on Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and I do that, come back, do my shower, then jump back and jump into my office. Brad will brief me on all the stuff, all the emails, text messages, stuff that needs to get done and dealt with. And then, you know, if it's a writing day, I'm at the computer and I'm writing. I'm writing until until 4.30. I stop at exactly 4.30. No matter what? No matter what. Even if you're on a roll? No matter what, yeah, even if okay. I'm on a roll. You know, right. and, and now, there are those times when, like, I had to finish this last screenplay because my agents were asking for it, and, you know, and I was just behind not... How do you keep that cognitive process going? So you're starting at 10 yeah. to 4. Do you take breaks? What are the... Yeah, like, I'll do, I'll do... I'll, I'll start, like, around 10, 30, 11. I'll, yeah, I have, like, a lunch break, so I'll have lunch. Um, and then, you know... You know, Even have, if you're in the flow, you'll take a break because it's so easy for no, you. No. Okay. No. So if I'm in the flow, I will. I will go hungry. <laughs> I will go hungry until I've gotten everything out of my mm -hmm. head onto the page that needs to get there. Um, um, I'll, I'll just. I'll just go hungry. I've had me Brad to tell you he's brought me lunch before and it's been cold because I'm just like I need. I'm just that type of person. I need to get this out of my head onto the page in this specific way. Um, and uh, and so. There are those times when, like, I had to get the screenplay in where I will, like, ask my, tell my nanny, hey, I need you to work an extra hour or till 5.30. Um, but for the most part, or, you know, or, like, when I had to have the screenplay in about two months ago, I just told her Sunday, I said, hey, on the days my wife works, you know, uh, which my work, wife works at the clinic every Wednesday and Thursday and every other Friday, mm -hmm. on those days, I'm going to be working until 5.30 until this is done and so she gets it so i'll add that hour on but like days like this where i don't have a deadline for a writing project or a film project or anything like that i cut it off at 4 30 and the reason why i cut it off is 4 30 so that i can give my kids the time yeah. because that's a part of my routine um you know my father died when i was five and so for me it's really important to have that face time with my kids you know and to no phones nothing no, i try no phones i'll be <laughs> honest i'll be honest like i i, I put my phone down and it frustrates me sometimes. Like the other day, I put my phone down 4.30. My agent called. It was it's super hard. important. It's difficult, right? Yeah, oh, it was super man. important. It's hard. And, uh, and my kids, we were outside playing because that's what we do. As soon as 4.30 hits, I mean, before 4.30 hits, 3.30, my Caleb is in. Daddy's at 4.30 at <laughs> Daddy. And, you know, we were out there. We started playing. And my phone rang, and I, it was this important call. I'm trying to dead this call, but then the kids are fighting, so I'm, like, getting a bit frustrated. But... Yeah, I, I try my best to make sure the phone is away and it's just me and the kids. Probably. And I, I, well, that's pretty much until dinner time. Wow. So we do that until dinner time, and you know, so that's 4:30. We're outside. We'll play till about 5:30 outside. Then we'll come in, and uh, I'll make them dinner when these are the days when my wife is mm. working, and I'll have dinner. We'll sit at the table and we'll eat. And then my wife will get home, and then once she gets home, and then we have we we we, we I have a chef to to help us ensure that we stay healthy. That's and then, smart. And we then, we've done that too. And, it's, and it's, yeah. the health thing is a big piece of it, but another is the time. Yes, it's because the time. I don't have to worry about like 
you know, and I granted it is a luxury, you know what I mean? But it's, I think it's something that I need because I travel so much. Mm -hmm. And when I'm home, I like to maximize the time with my kids. So it, I, I don't have to be like, hey, it's, like, no, all right, go sit down true. in front of the right. TV while I cook, you know? So it really, really helps with that. And and then we have, we you know, we have dinner. And then after dinner, well, maybe like, we, they're not allowed to watch cartoons or t like TV shows during the week, but they can watch sports. So but not every day so if there's a baseball game on or a basketball game on like we'll watch sports and we'll you know I'll point out certain things like see how he's doing that see why mm -hmm. he's not being a teammate certain things so they get oh, wow. some so type you're starting of education to educate you're educating them in that way absolutely absolutely and then you know we put the kids down for bed and and then after that me and my wife has we have our time to talk and and you because i mean you know how it is being married like you have you know you know, she's gone from, she leaves at for seven for clinic and doesn't get back home till six. And, right. then, you know, then it's the kids. And then it's important for a couple to have their time to converse and, you know, and, and just follow up and have conversation. And we do that. And then, you know, I'm in bed by her about, depends, well, you know, lately because of my book, like I've been having to kind of do some work after she mm -hmm. goes to bed, which, That'll take me till about 11 o'clock. Do you find you're effective or you can power through no matter what? Of when it's worth writing at night? Yeah, right? that's oh, tough. I mean, for me, dude, my, and the way I am is if I'm getting paid for something, mm -hmm. a lot of money, especially mm -hmm. when it's a lot of money, you know, I'm going to get it done I'm gonna no get matter it what. Done. Like, there is no, there is no, you know, oh, I'm tired. It's, I, I've just never been that way. And uh, in my in my business partners, they're always just like, dude, like. It's true. Know. I have to say, yeah. I've yeah. seen it yeah. firsthand. Yeah, your husband. I'm my, sure your husband, yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. I have, you know, it's interesting. I, I do really feel like it's a privilege that mm -hmm. I get to know a lot of the team guys yeah, yeah, yeah. in that way, yeah. you know, whether it's, you know, usually friends with their wives and yeah. we're all friends yeah. and there is a certain work ethic yeah. that it's, I, it's <laughs> almost a level of suffering yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that individuals can endure yeah, that, yeah. you know, I thought that I work really yeah. hard. Shane is up at 4.30 in the morning yeah. and he's telling me if I cared enough about my stuff, I would get up earlier. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And yep. so there is this, uh, you know, I don't know if you think that it's... Um, Nurture and nature. Yeah. I think it's a combination. I, 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 well, no, I, I'll back up. I think that it's, it's three. I think there are there is that nature where you're just born with the genetic... DNA that you know that makes you that way without an unequivocal doubt like regardless of what your life situation is you will you be that will way be that hard charger focus get the job done it's just interwoven into your DNA um so I so that's one two but I also believe that there's 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 a uh, nurture where it's it, there are those people where they don't have the genetic skill sets at all um um but they go through trials in life in a certain way that mm -hmm. that kind of you know forces them to kind of like evolution you know evolution you know forces them to either grow or die off you know and so you know so I, I think there is a level to that but then I also think that there's a combination and again I could be wrong on all of this but I think that there's a combination where where you know maybe it's maybe it's thirty maybe mm -hmm. it's thirty seventy. Nurture nature, maybe it's 50 50, maybe it's 40 60 for a different person, uh, maybe it's 90 10, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, um, so that's, I mean, that's where my thought process is. Do on. you ever hit any low points? And if you do, I'm curious as to how you re engage or, or come back. From you, know, them. you know, when I got out, I hit a lot of low points. Um, do you think it was because of the intensity of the work and then coming into? Yeah, I think it was just, you know, just, you know, the stuff that I experienced having been in combat mm -hmm. and then, you know, and then the big thing was from the, the hardest thing for me to deal with, you know, in the teams, in the military, but specific, even more so in the teams, there's this loyalty, mm -hmm. there's this integrity, there's this a, sure. a team guy, you know. I've if, definitely seen that. If, you, if you're... If you tell your, you know, your your uh, your OIC or your, you know, the guy in your fire team, I'm gonna be at this place at this time, and come hell or high water, it's yeah. gonna happen, and vice versa. 
and there are, there's no wine, there's no backstab, there's none of that. It's just like, it's a brotherhood. That's why it's, you know, it's called the brotherhood. And I could rely on guys, and I could still rely on the mm. team guys I served with, or even team guys I didn't serve with because of that, because that's part of our community. Mm -hmm. And the hardest thing for me when I got out was finding that. You know what I mean, and 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 having that, and I'm because it was so much a part of my nature. The last eight years of my life after I got out, I just figured everybody was like that. Yeah. Like I was a bit naive in a sense, and I figured hey, every everybody's going to keep their word. Everybody's going to show up right. on time. Everybody's going to carry their weight and give 110 percent. And that just wasn't the case. And that was something that was really, really hard for me to deal with. Like mm. I like like cognitively I couldn't understand it you know I could not grasp it and that led me in that led me to some low points mm -hmm. you know because I was just like what is wrong with the world yeah. what is wrong with people right you know and so it took me you know with my faith and prayer and, and, and reading the bible and just you know and just you know re surrounding myself around team guys when I could and and just and just learning that everybody's not going to have the same level of integrity and loyalty and that same type of motivation as the guys that I serve with had. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. And I have to be okay with that. And I have to be able to meet that person, you know, halfway or 70% of the way, or maybe even 80, 90% mm. of the way. You know what I mean? And I'm sure you've had this conversation with your husband. Where, All the I, time. Where my wife has yelled at me many a time. <laughs> she's just like, everybody's not a seal, Remy. Like, everybody, <laughs> you know what I mean? Everybody's not going to be like that, dude. Like, relax, chill out. And so it, was, it took even my wife, you know, it took my wife, you know, just reminding me over and over and over again, you know, everybody's not going to be <laughs> like the guys you right. serve with. Like, you have to be okay with that. And it's not even, and, and she wasn't just saying in a sense of okay. an integrity thing. It was also in the sense of like, everybody's not going to be able to operate at that same level. Yes, you can stay up till three in the morning writing and then wake up and, and wake up at five yeah. and then stay up till three. You can do that, but everybody's not going to want, want to work at that level. Right. You know, you and you as a leader of a company and businesses, they, they, you have to you have to be okay with that. Yeah. And how do you teach your children in terms of work ethic? And because their life yeah. is probably a bit, you know, it's interesting. The world that we're living in right now mm. is it's crazy. It is crazy. It's nuts. It's nuts. And also the way in which people talk yeah. to each other yep. and communicate. Yep. You know, I obviously was not in the military, although yeah. I did apply to the Navy before I did my oh, fellowship. Did did I did, you? and I decided, I ended up doing a fellowship instead of going to the Navy. Hey, well, you did serve in the Navy because your husband was in, and so Back to and duty, all, yeah. every wife, you know, uh, of <laughs> you a got spouse. you got that, honey. Yeah, um, <laughs> it serves in the Navy. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it, it, it's really interesting in the mm. world that we live in, even in academics mm. uh, and the military. You would, if you were a jerk to someone yeah. or you were disrespecting you would get yeah. punched in the throat yep yep <laughs> yep you know my shane watches yeah. the you know the instagram you know instagram uh, all these he's he, it is yeah it is now flourishing and creating yeah. this but this way of communicating yeah. and then it breeds yeah. division yeah. in terms of yeah. humanity yeah. when we seem to be at a time where we really need to come together yeah. Whether yeah. it's medicine or, you know, at least from my perspective, yeah. medically, we, yeah. we all need to become a team, and it's 100%. so yeah, divisive yeah. now. And it, you know, it's it. I, I did a post a couple of weeks. I can't remember was it a month or two months or three months ago, something like that, where I was like, social media has given people a license to say stuff to other people that they know damn well they wouldn't say to those Ever. people if they saw them walking down the street. Ever. You know, and it's and and that's the weird thing. It's like it's like, and, and it, what kills me even more so <laughs> when, when it's people from my generation, our generation. You know what I mean? Where it's just like, come on, especially like, come on, dude. Like you knew that this was the '90s. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you had you know damn well like you wouldn't get away with that. You wouldn't get away with running up to a dude in the street and saying that, and then saying something rude, and then running up. Like you know that. Like you know that's the way you were raised. Right. You were great. Like. I don't get it because I know I would never do that. Like if I have a problem with guys, or if a problem with a person in general, and it's affecting me that bad, you talk where to I feel them. like yeah. I need to say something. Well, most of the times it's just like it doesn't affect me. It's just like you know because it is what it is. But if it's that offensive to me, mm. then I'll go 
check you a per I'll go say it to you a person like, hey, I got a problem with you, yeah. what you said, X, Y, and Z, but it just kills me. It's like this license that social media gives to people to do stuff and say stuff, it just emboldens people to, yeah. to act in a way that they know they want to act and it's because they know that they have that level of protection. And it's not just like protection from a physical altercation, it's protection from just maybe even a verbal altercation yeah. in person. It's like, it's, I, I don't know, I don't get it. I talk about it with my friends all the time, man, who I grew up with, and we're just like, this makes no sense. Like, yeah. it, it, and, and, then, and you're pretty, I would say that, would you, or you should say, would you say you're pretty immune to criticism? Yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, it doesn't bother me at all. Like the only, the, like, like, because to me it's just words. You know what I mean? Like that's just yeah. the way, like, like it's not action, it's not real to me unless it's, again, it's not real to me unless it's something, it, it, one, it depends on who, if it's coming from somebody who I trust and somebody who knows me, like, then it's good. Criticism is good. You need criticism. Like that's mm -hmm. a, that's like, it's a part of life. And that's again, when, when we got back from an op, every op I went on, the first thing we did when we got back from an Sustains op. Sustains and a, improves. Yeah, we did a lessons learned. Mm -hmm. We did an AR yeah. after action group. We talked about the good things that happened, but we also talked about the bad things mm -hmm. that happened, the bad things that, you know, I did wrong or somebody else did wrong on an op. And that's necessary because that criticism makes the team better. So I'm all for criticism especially as a writer, you know, I tell him, and you know, my, <laughs> my agent, my literary agent who reps me as a screenwriter, he is the most, he will tell me, he'll be like, like, Remy, this is <laughs> garbage. This, this is, is terrible. Dumb. Like, I'm yeah. not going to be able to, and I love that. Yeah. You know what I mean? I love that because if, if I don't get that, then I'm going to, he's going to send it out into the marketplace and it's not going to be well received. And then I'm not going to know why. And then I'm not going to get better. Right. I'm not going to get better. And so I, 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 I love criticism. It's necessary for me to grow as a mm. storyteller, as a writer, director, as a husband, as a father. Like, I, I, I love it. Now, so it, one, it depends on where it comes from, um, for sure. But if it's not coming from the right source. Which nowadays, it, it can come from anywhere. It can come from anywhere. And it's just, it's just like water off my back. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. like one off my back. It's but just like I think that that's unique yeah. in the way that you're a bit hardened to. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that let me say this a different way. Yeah. I think a lot of people going into the public eye, like yeah. you are, yeah. probably are not as hardened to criticism in that way. Yeah, yeah. 100%. I mean, you have a capacity yeah. because of how you grew up, because of your experience, because yeah. of. Um, and a lot of it had to do with the way I grew up. Because I'm gonna tell you, man, growing up in the Bronx, man, like the stuff that we would do to each other, like and say, I'm stuff sure we would to say to each other, like just, just the stuff we would say to each other, like we call it snapping. It was this mm -hmm. thing, like I'm gonna snap on you, and it was like it was literally saying jokes and talking about each other's mother until the other person cried. <laughs> and I've seen a lot of kids cry <laughs> because of the things that were said. Yeah. And it was just the fights, like yeah. slap by every time, every summer. The big kids would draw a box, or they would get chalk, on, go on a concrete and draw a big, like, uh, boxing ring. It's intense. On the concrete, uh, and the concrete would chalk and, and pick the little kids, me and my brother and other little kids, and be like, get in there. And it's a slap boxing fight. And that slap boxing fight always turned into a fist fight. Mm. And now, then I turned into a name call. And I turned, so it's like growing up that way where you're just being criticized and belittled and made fun. And like, we call it bullying now, but it made me the man I am today. You Are know? you worried about the softness of our, the next 100%. generation? This next generation is, is so soft. It's, it's, it's like, and that's why there's certain things I keep away from my kids. There's yeah. so many things my kids can't even watch on TV because I don't, I don't want them to be unconsciously programmed to, to not be able to take criticism. I don't want them to be programmed to, 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 to be weak and to not understand the importance of hard work and th to believe that you're just going to be handed everything because you know, you're not going to be handed everything. Mm. And so 100%, like... This, these next generation, I, I'm, I'm just, it's, it makes me nervous. Yeah. Because it's just like this, it's like, can I have a day off because it is? Or, or, you know, like, and another thing, 
with social media in this generation is like Instagram, like things come so in, insta, insta, yeah. instant, quick, yeah. right? And they see- Fast dopamine hit. Fast, yeah, and they see, like they mm -hmm. get the like and that feeds them and they, and they you know, and or they see people who have, who are actors or a doctor or all, and they don't understand the concept of time. They forgot the concept time to mature and time. work. And consistency. And effort. 100%, and it, take, it could take years like it could take years. years for you to get to, to your dream. And then you years. may not even get to your dream. And there's yeah. so many people who are like, you know, oh, I have this dream and they expect it to come fast. And when it doesn't come fast and they quit. Yeah. And then they, and then what does that do that? How do you, how do you work quitting. with your, yes. How yeah. do you kind of address that with your kids? Cause I'm sure what? they get frustrated and they just are like, okay, well. Oh, well. I mean, cause we have all, you and I both have very yeah, little kids. And, I tell them no. Like, like you know, I tell my kid, like, you know, case in point, the other day Caleb was like, he was losing at a game or some type mm. of competition with his brother. He says, I don't want to do this anymore. And he didn't want to do it because he wasn't in there. He didn't want to do it because he lost. And I said, no, you will go back and you will keep, you will finish this game until the end. Mm. There is no quitting. There is no, I'm feeling uncomfortable or I lost, so therefore I'm gonna stop. Because then I told him, I said, you And gonna, how old's Caleb? He's, he's seven. Seven, okay. And I told him, I said, you're gonna lose in life. I was like, mommy has lost in life a million times. Daddy has lost in mm -hmm. life a million times. And you're gonna lose a million times in life. Mm. But that's okay. But it, losing does not give you a license to quit. So like, I literally tell him, and I make him go back in there. Yeah, he might be crying, a tear comes down his eye. But you know what, five minutes later, he's, He's smiling and he's back to normal. Whereas um, I think some parents would be like, oh, it's okay, come over here. and yeah. You don't have to do it anymore. And what do they learn from that? They just get programmed to quit when things get mm. hard or when they fail or when they lose. And so that's what I do with my kids. And I, and I, you know, I show my kids by example, you know, look at daddy, daddy's going to the gym. Why is daddy going to the gym? Because daddy needs to stay fit. Because yeah. this is what daddy, this is part of daddy's job. Like daddy's writing at the computer. Like, and that's what I love about when I'm home, working from home, because they could open door policy. They can come to my office mm. anytime and see daddy and see me working and see me writing. And they'll ask me, what are you writing? Are you writing a movie? What? And I show them little things on the computer. And, and you know, and sometimes they're able to travel with me when I go do speaking engagements. Like when I worked on the plane movie last year in Puerto Rico, they came out, they came to set. Mm. They see the work that daddy does so that that way it's like there's an understanding. So they're inoculated with hard work, with respect. Yep. With discipline, 100%. it sounds like, and your mom was was as disciplinary as, as you would allow her oh, to yeah. be, because exactly. exactly. maybe a, a little crazy. Exactly. Do you feel like there's any demons from the teams or the upbringing that kind of comes through in your life now? Because, you know, that's a lot of early programming. Yeah, hundred um, percent. That's a great question. Um, I'd like to thank another sponsor of the podcast, and that is First Form. Listen, First Form just came out with their brand new energy drink and First Form Energy. I have Citrus Blast in my hand. Amazing, amazing. It has B vitamins in there, niacin, some caffeine. It has something called Neurofactor, whole coffee fruit extract. Bioprene, a little black pepper in there, tastes amazing, a little bit of choline for brain function. Even better, there is free U.S. shipping and all military addresses, no matter where in the world, get free shipping or just about free shipping. Go to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion, firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. If you know me, you know I love this company. I work very closely with them. And hey, Will, if you're listening, I need another case of those energy drinks. Go to firstform.com. That's one S-T-P-H-O-R-M dot com slash Dr. Lion. I know that you will love this product. I would just say you know, th that, that drive and that frustration that comes from people who do not want to match that drive. Mm. And, it, it, and what it goes back to, I think, is empathy. I think that's something that I do struggle with because, again, I've had a hard life. 
and, and, and I don't say empathy in general, I'll just say empathy as it relates to s situations where a person that I'm working with or, you know, is, is struggling. Do you find it's very binary where you can really separate that there's empathy at home and then at work is different? Oh, 100%, 100%. 100%. But I, but I, I think it, it goes back to the person who's like, I can't. Mm. I can't do this or I want to give up because, you know, I don't feel like I'm doing the right or I feel like I'm failing. The demon that I fight is like, how do I empathize with that person, not get frustrated, not get angry, and just try to come down to their level and help gradually bring them up. Mm. I think that that's, that's something that I struggle with. And it, it, even this idea of, like when I first, when I first came out to, and this could be bad, but I'll just say, you know, <laughs> when, I, when I first came out, got, got out of the, even before I got out of the military, before, when I first, I would say halfway through the military, my time in the military, I see homeless people, homeless vets, and I'd always give them money. Mm. I'd always give homeless vets money. And then like a part of me was like, as I got, as, as, after I got out and I was like, man, you got the post 9-11 GI Bill, you have 0% freaking right. down on a home yeah. loan. You have education that you mm -hmm. could have gotten while you were getting out. You got all these, you got business loans, you got all of these, these people that want to throw, I mean, all these foundations yeah. that want to help veterans and help you yep. get on the right path. And then it's just like, Again, it might sound bad, but it's just like, there's no excuses. Now, I grant, like, there are those situations where somebody's just mentally gone, right? They're mentally, you know, PTSD, severe PTSD, and it's hard for them to function. Obviously, I empathize with people like that. But I know of veterans that got out and just tried to suck on their system as much as they could and, 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 and still end up broke. Right. And, and they don't want to put the work in. And for me, that angers me. And is it because you've worked so hard, or it's just your DNA? I think it's I think it's a combination of both. I think it's a combination because I've you know I've bust my butt. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've really yeah. bust my ass. And then and then it's the DNA. You know, seeing my mom like work hard to provide for my brother and I. Like seeing my mom like you know, there's certain things I know she doesn't like to talk about because she you know. But you know, I tell her like I tell her all the time, mom, you, it's okay, dude. It's okay that like. You know, we were in a bad neighborhood. It's like it's not a bad thing. It's okay that like right. you didn't have enough money like to feed to to feed yourself. You had just enough money to feed my brother and I. Like those things are okay. But you know, seeing those things and seeing my mom like struggle and going to the rent office with my mom and and hearing her mm -hmm. like ask for extra time, an extra two days to pay the bills, and then seeing her come back and like work like overtime or t you know. At, at the museum or whatever so that she can get the money to pay the bills you know seeing her like give you know having to wash her clothes with a bar of ivory soap because she had no money to do laundry to buy detergent mm -hmm. and put coins in the machine and then having my brother and i do the same thing like all of those things were ingrained in me you know by watching my mom that you know life is hard but you can match how hard life is by doing hard work mm. and that can help you get out. You can match yeah. how hard life is by doing hard work. By doing hard work. Yeah. And she did that and that was ingrained in me. And so- Is your brother like that too? Oh, 100% my brother. I mean, he graduated from high school in three years, graduated from college in three years, got his master's in, uh, from Syracuse University in- uh, He's an engineer. Engineering, yeah. engineering in one year. And the dude is, the dude is, he's, he's, he's a lot more, ten, people used to always think that I was the older brother because I was always bigger than him. He's a year older than me and he's just always been like a timid, nerdy type guy. But he, he does, he has that, drive you know that, that drive to, to do the work mm -hmm. you know what i mean and he's going through a situation right now i won't touch on but where he's you know he's he's been the one that's done all of this hard mm. work that's built this built this amazing career kind of well. and you know you got people trying to mooch off of him and take it and, and it's frustrating and it's disheartening to him because of the fact that he's he's done all of this hard it's work to, so hard. to get to where he is so yeah it's uh you know, and going back to the, the Insta, Instagram thing and social media thing, again, kids and people, they, in general, they see things and they expect it to come fast. And easy. And easy. Yeah. And it's not. And it takes years. That's the one message I share, you know, for people who are listening. This is, you know, that you could pass up to your kids is you got to understand that 
that to get to the top takes years and it takes consistency and it takes being rejected and it takes failing and it takes learning from those failures and picking yourself back up again and it takes sleepless nights it takes a lot and a lot of thick skin and a lot of thick skin and that's something that's missing nowadays you know is this is everybody's just so sensitive you know very I mean? entitled and entitled sensitive entitled and, and it's I don't know I, I'm just I'm just nervous for the way things are going to be I tell you what though our kids are going to be savages compared to <laughs> they are else. going to crush yeah, it yeah yeah, yeah. everybody else yeah you know, no they are going to crush it because yes. they, they're getting something that used to be standard I mean yes I mean, it used to be standard you know and when we were coming up you know what yes I mean? and yes. it's like it's not standard anymore it's right. like you know and so you know whatever it is what it is yeah, yeah. um I just have a couple more questions. Yeah. I'm curious, is there anything that you do to maintain your focus during, so for example, I don't know, caffeine, no, neurotropics, do anything do, like no, that no. as you're going through kind of maintaining your focus? No, I don't drink coffee. I don't, I don't, I don't, only supplements that I do, yeah. uh, you know, the only supplement that I do is, um, um, a vegan protein. Mm. Um, uh, no fish oil, uh, nothing, no nothing. fish oil, okay. none of that, no, nothing. No, mm. just, uh, I, I don't know. I've just, I've just been, been able to kind of learn how to stay focused. My focus is the carrot. And the crazy thing is my son is, my oldest son is dyslexic and, you know, um, and he is a shout out to seal kids, which they work with seal foundation. They, they, uh, help out with and we're able to connect my son with a tutor that works with kids who mm. have learning disabilities and uh but my son he's really smart he's just mm. but he's really smart and i was talking to his teacher the other day and she was just like kaden is goal oriented like like if you say that he's going to get this or like this is going to happen you know he will climb mount everest to get it done mm. And I was just like, it's so interesting because I had had dyslexia as a kid mm. you know, a little bit. And and I've always been that way where it's like, if I know that one plus one equals two, I know that if I do this, then I will get this outcome. Then I'm, fo I'm like thousand laser, yards focused. Laser on, focused, you know, action oriented. That's it. You know, and in case of point, you, I, I'll use this film. Um, the, sh the short film, I, I, I wrote and directed the short film. Is that your first? That's it's, your first, first solo. Project. Amazing. That's my first and one. You're also working on a, another one. The feature version, um, which is a two hour version of the short film. And then I have another film that I wrote that's set up with a big production company. And I can't mention it yet. We have we attached a big movie star to it. Um, that'll probably get announced in the next six months or so. Um, I want to direct it, but it's like a $90 million film. So the studio's not. So you're, you're totally ready for that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The studio won't let me direct it until I direct something. So I'm setting up. but. But I directed the, wrote and directed the short, mm -hmm. the unexpected, and then my age sent it to my reps and my agents and my agents and my lawyer, and they loved it. They were like, "Remy, this is amazing." They said the only issue is, like, we can't get this, we can't do anything further with this with it because it's just a thirty-two minute short film. But you need to write it right. If you write the two-hour feature version, since you've already done the proof of concept, like we can set you up to be the director for the feature mm -hmm. version, right? And this could be your first, you know, your first two hour film. And at the time I was like, I had just come off working on a, a Lionsgate film, the plane for two months, and then went from there to work on a UK TV show called Who Dares Wins. And then, you know, so when my agent got, this was October, I've been gone for like four months, this is the end of October. And so my agent told me that I was like, man, I need, I need, I just, I need a break you right now. Yeah. And like, cause I'm, I don't, like it didn't really register to me the carrot that he was dangling in front mm. of me, which was I can I, I can this can happen. So I wasn't motivated. I didn't have that focus. So you know yourself. You can leverage your own humanness exactly. when you need to, and be realistic at uh -huh. times too. Just be like, ah, oh, yeah, but you know, if I write this, like, what are the odds? Like, I need to see something more tangible. Mm. You know, that's going to guarantee that if I write this thing, then I'm going to be able to get paid to direct this thing. And so fast forward to January, my publicist. Uh, Lon Haber, he uh, he finally watched the short. He was like, "This is amazing." He called me up, 
and he was like, hey, I represent, he mentioned some big studios, A24 being one of them and a few others. He's like, I think these people would, would love to this short. So I was like, sure, sh share it to him. So he sh shared with them and he shared it with, you know, A24, XYZ, um, a film mode, bunch of other, you know, financiers and studios. And he, and he shared it with them for them to buy it and distribute it mm. because streamers do distribute wide right. short films. So he was trying to get some type of partnership with one of these studios so that they could walk it into like a Netflix or HBO Max. Mm. And so they watched and it was like, this is great, but we can't buy a short because there's no mar real market right. for it right now when you know, went out a streamer. But if this guy writes this as a feature, you know, we'll get behind this. And by them saying, and Lon called me up and he told me what they said, and by that was the carrot. That mm. was what I, that, that was the, that was the thing that I was able to focus on, mm. right? And so he was like, Remy, you need to write this thing because I've talked to people at studios, financiers who have money who are serious about making a film. And if you write this thing, they're interested. They're, there's going to be, and this is not a thing where my agent said, well, you, you write know, it you write and then it's maybe. Then, 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 yeah, it's yeah. Like, no, they're ready. It's, it's going to increase opportunities. So that Incredible. was the character. So when I saw that, I dropped everything mm. and I was just locked into writing that film because I had a goal. I had an outcome, kind of like with my son, you know. He he, he like, you know, the teacher says, well, if you do this, this, and this, I'll let you shoot, you know, because my son loves basketball, so I'll let you go out and shoot a couple yeah. hoops. So he's thinking, like, I know this is hard, but I'm going to be focused and get it done so I can go shoot, you know, five hoops outside. And so that was, that's the way my mind is. I don't need caffeine, going back to your main question, I don't need caffeine mm -hmm. or supplements or, or, you know, whatever. It's just... And sometimes I don't even need sleep. <laughs> you know I, mean? it's just one I believe it. It's one of those things where it's just like, as long as I, you know, have that, have a vision yeah. of what's to come, then I'm locked in on that vision until it's done. You know, I could talk to you for another hour, but I won't subject you to yeah, that. That's all good. Okay. Um, but I, I will Let's say, uh, okay, yeah. great. Um, I, I will say what you're doing for the audience is that mm -hmm they're being able to witness mm -hmm. what that drive yeah. is. So we're talking about films, we're talking about transitioning, yeah. but what you're really providing them with mm -hmm. is a framework for how you execute. Yeah, 100%. And that's incredible. Yeah, yeah, and, it's, it's a and, process. And it's unusual. <laughs> and, but, you know, it's so crazy that you say it's unusual because again- It's all me, you've known. It's you know, for me, it's logical and it's normal because it's like one, what I always go back to is one plus one equals two. If, you, if there's 12 steps to get to the top of a, to get to the first floor of a, the second floor of a building, and you walk those 12 steps, take 12 steps, you will get to the top. But people are witnessing yeah. also your growth mindset. Yeah. It's it's inviting criticism in. Yeah, yeah. It's executing on things to make you better. And it's yeah. also very action oriented. Yes, yes, yes. And that is, so the combination of inviting criticism, yeah. having action, yeah. And perspective, yep. totally unusual. Yep. It's, I guess it's unusual for the times we're in. <laughs> it's unusual for the times we're in. Yeah, I guess it's unusual. You know, yeah, I, I do have one final question. Yeah. Um, do you visualize? Yes, yes, 100%. I do. I mean, it, it was something that I learned in the teams, because, you know, and in, 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 actually even before the teams, mm. Buds and NDOC, um, they teach the four pillars of mental toughness. Goal setting, visualization, positive self-talk, and arousal control. And I didn't realize it uh, uh, until later, but those are some things that I had been doing even as a kid. Like, you know, positive self-talk. Hey, I could do this. I could be an NBA. Mm -hmm. I can make this money. You know, visualizing like that success. Goal setting, eating an elephant one bite at a time. And, and, and so I've taken that with me from you know, probably doing it unconsciously or, or being unaware of doing mm -hmm. it as a kid, and, and really learning the principles and being able to put specific you know verbal tags on mm -hmm. it and definitions, and then having to apply it in bonds, yeah. like you know having to apply it in Hell Week, having to you know visualize you know again well, the combination of goal setting and visualization, you know starting Hell Week on Sunday, not visualizing Friday because if you visualize Friday, you'll you most likely quit because mm -hmm. that's a big chunk right. a lot for the brain to process. But 
you know, again, using combination of goal setting and visualization, visualize getting to the next evolution. For some guys, they visualize getting to the next meal. For me, it was just visualizing getting to the mm -hmm. next evolution. And, and, and when I did that, and I achieved that goal, it gave me more confidence to visualize getting to the next. Mm -hmm. and, get, and so just, I do it all the time. Like you even do. now with everything, even in fitness, like when I'm working out, like I think we all kind of do it, but like when I'm freaking, when I jump on a pull-up bar, you know, like today I did a pull-up workout today and it was like, as soon as I jump on a bar, like I'm almost like visualizing the number I'm gonna get to, mm. you know what I mean? And it's always, and, and, and like, and it's holding to that vision. It's holding to I'm going to hit 30 straight, right? Or it's and and, and it's, it's it's holding to that, and then holding to it, like it helps me get you there. Accomplish but, it. Yeah, but if I visualize 15, or if I visualize 20, then I'm not going to get to 30 when I can do 30. You know, so it's it's something I do in fitness. It's something I do in writing. It's something you know. You have to. I mean, mm -hmm. we have to do as writers, right? You have to be able to visualize. You know, you know what you're trying to put on paper, so that that way you can help flow organically and 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 and, and bring the this puzzle because writing at times can be a mental puzzle. Bring it all together, mm -hmm. and so. So, yeah, it's definitely short answer. Yes, it's absolutely something I do every day. Well, Remy, yeah, you are a savage, <laughs> and yeah. the world is really lucky yeah. to have you. Well, thank you so much. The world's lucky to have you as well. Thank you for pulling this off, and you know all the insight that you pass on. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And where can people find you? You're very active in, in all domains, and yeah. do you have the the big. I, you have a lot of projects coming yeah. up, so. So I can be found on uh, Instagram, just Remy Adelaide, Twitter, same thing. I was blessed with a unique name, so. <laughs> and I'll tag you, I'll put yeah. all this stuff in here. That's all good. You know. uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, my Facebook, for those, my mm -hmm. Facebook has been dead for some reason for the last four months, I can't post on it. Um, and then, yeah, and then I have my apparel company, Kedja Wear, where, you know, it's all about, you know, inspiring, motivating, and educating through wear, so I can be found on that on our website, website, KedjaWear.com. Amazing. Or our Instagram handle, KedjaWear. Um, yeah, at KedjaWear. Great, I'll yeah. tag it. Thanks yeah. so much. No, thank you. Thanks okay. for having me.